We have to prove that there's a better way. And that's what PCRM's job is. We have doctors, we have scientists to show how uh, we can do good diabetes research, good cancer research, good heart disease research. And then once we know what it is, we got to push it. And I want to share with you some of the challenges that are ahead. And the first thing I want to show you, this is, this is a dog. When I was in medical school, one afternoon, the professor said, uh, next week is dog lab. And we all knew what that meant. That meant every four students got a dog. And the dog is put on the table, strapped down, given drugs, and at the end of the afternoon, the dog is in a trash bag. And every medical student went through that. It was absolutely required. And I was a, sort of a cocky student. And I said to my professors, you know, I didn't come to medical school to kill my first patient, and that's going to be my first patient. I'm not doing this. And they said, it's required, you have to do this. But some of the other students heard I was refusing, and so they refused to do it as well. And that was really before animal rights was such a big thing. And, well, anyway, it, it wasn't so hard to do. And we devised an alternative. We passed the course. I'm on the faculty today, and the course is gone. So anyway, but uh, when, when we started PCRM, I decided I do not want doctors and nurses and pediatricians training on animals, because if they do, they think it's essential. So we started working on them. This was the kind of thing that, that was, it, it was as crude as that picture looks. But when we started, there were animal labs in all of these cities, and as we worked, we knocked them out one after another, after another, after another. And we were pretty happy by about 2007. But then we started keep working on them. And then, uh, actually, after I made this slide, we knocked out the university, um, that's the Medical College of Wisconsin, and the University of, of Virginia. There's five left. We're going to knock them all out. Um, and so thank you for making that happen. Um, but wait a minute. Dogs are used in another way. Trauma surgeons would take dogs, and they really would beat them up. They put tubes in their chest, they put tubes down their throat, and, and by the end of the afternoon, the dogs are so injured, they have to be killed. And that became so unpopular, they figured, well, nobody would care if we would use a goat or a pig, or some animal that nobody cares about. But what we realized is, A, it's cruel, B, that's not the way to train a surgeon is on the wrong kind of anatomy. So we worked with a company called Simulab that makes this exactly a human simulator. It even bleeds. And we have been knocking out virtually, uh, virtually every trauma lab. Um, the hardest one was the universe, um, what was uh, in Boston. Uh, and it took a lot of uh, work to get Mass General Hospital to stop traumatizing dogs, but they finally did. And now, uh, almost all medical centers do all their trauma training without animals. So thank you for that. I know that along the way, a lot of our members called and wrote and harassed people, and it's all <laughs> good. That's how to get things done. Um, and then we came across military training. They would take vervet monkeys. And in case soldiers had to deal with chemical warfare poisonings, they would every couple months take the monkeys out of the cage, hit them with chemical warfare agents, and then let the trainees see the animals writhe and seize. And we thought that is so grotesquely cruel, and you don't need to do that. And we had to work so hard, and I know a lot of you here made calls to the military and sent them emails and letters. What finally got it done is we worked with many members of Congress, and Representative Bartlett, dragged two generals into his office and said, why are you poisoning the monkeys, guys? And that's all it took. And so we worked together. We got them basically on the carpet, and they ended it. So um, the, uh, thank you for making that happen. Um, now, we don't forget the little guys. Um, it's so easy to say we don't care about them. They're too small. But uh, this is what happens. Can you see this? Every day of their lives, this happens to, to thousands and thousands of, ma of mice and rats, they are stuffed into this tube the size of a baby bottle and then the, a stopper is put on the back. They do that to make sure they inhale every last drop of a pesticide that we're testing. Um, and then they're let out, put back in the cage the next day, same story over and over and over again. So we have toxicologists who have the unsexy job of looking at how these tests are done and showing the 
that you don't have to do them showing better ways. This is a pesticide. This will, this will not be on the test, but there was a company called Wellmark that wanted to market this and the EPA said you've got to test it, you've got to do these cruel things. Dogs and rats. And this is another one. This is an herbicide from Dow. And same story, dog tests uh, and rat tests mostly, sometimes primate tests. And so our toxicologists, sometimes we work with the pesticide manufacturers and we work with Dow and we, we decide, you don't want to do the animal test, we don't want to do it, and we work with the government to knock them out. And we managed to convince the federal government to, and Wellmark to stop its animal test and Dow as well. So it's... It's, it's a big job, but sometimes it works, so thank you for that. Um, and this is, this is a squirrel monkey. They're small enough to sit in your hand, and that is the biggest liability. Because what that means is, yes, they're cute, but researchers have discovered they're really easy to manipulate. NASA shot this monkey into space. Um, they don't want to put a chimpanzee or gorilla up there. A squirrel monkey fits just fine. So. What we discovered was that NASA decided they needed to bombard them with radiation to show what would happen if humans took a trip to Mars. What kind of interstellar or, or interplanetary radiation would, we, would be, we be exposed to? And we felt, A, it's cruel, B, it's grossly unscientific and there are better ways to study radiation effects. And it took a, a lot of effort, but we used, used our usual thing where we go down to Capitol Hill, we get members of Congress involved to fight. Many of you called and wrote and said you can't be doing this. This was on Long Island in Brookhaven National Laboratory. They weren't gonna change, weren't gonna change, weren't gonna change, but finally, just there was so much public pressure and so many doctors involved. Um, this is April Stevens, she resigned uh, from NASA saying I will not be doing this. Um, and finally, NASA canceled the experiments. You just, you just gotta outlast them and you can win. So thank you for that. Um, chimpanzees, a lot of you have been helping us fight the battle for, for chimpanzees. Uh, because, you know, it's the one species that can tell you with American Sign Language, I don't want to be in your damn laboratory. And they can say that to you. Um, and so now there is a bill in Congress called the Great Ape Protection Act that would say the United States will do what every other civilized country has done which is to ban this kind of testing. Well, it's, let me tell you, we are having a battle. We're having a big fight now, and, and time is very short because Congress wants to all leave to go home and get reelected. Um, so that's Congress's number. Many of you have called. Uh, please write that down. But I, but I do want to say, and I know many of you have been helping us with this. I don't know if we're going to win the passage of that act, but I want to tell you something else that has happened. There was a group of chimpanzees in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Some of you know about this and have helped us with this. 200 of them. NIH wanted to take them out of retirement, put them back into a laboratory. And 14 of them were already transferred to a laboratory in Texas, and they wanted all the rest. We said, no, you can't do that. You've got to leave them alone. Many of these animals were elderly, infected with HIV, or infected with hepatitis C, and, and they'd say, we can find an experiment for them. We said, you, you have, anyway, it became a huge, huge controversy. Here's what happened. We got so many members of Congress inflamed that NIH, the National Institutes of Health said, all right, fine. They convened an independent panel through the Institute of Medicine to decide whether the animals would be used or not. We got the panel roster and it had three people on it who were died in the wool animal experimenters who were not going to cave. And our cardiologist, John Pippin, worked with the panel to get them kicked out. We got them replaced with some better people. When the report came out, finally, it basically said there isn't any use of chimpanzees that you can really make a scientific case for it being necessary. They wrote this report, they sent it to NIH, NIH is implementing it now, and we are seeing the beginning of the end of all chimpanzee experiments. So. I don't know if we're going to win this, this ban, but it's going to be finished. I, it's going to be finished within just a few years. So that's a good thing. But we're not there yet. That's the good news. There's some bad news. First of all, there are animals on a lot of people's plates. Meat eating. 
is going way, way up. And the big increase now is what? Chicken. It's chicken. Uh, Americans now eat a million chickens per hour. Uh, cheese going way, way up. And, and every slice of cheese that anybody ate came from a cow who was impregnated annually and gave birth to a female calf who then joined the dairy herd and all the male calves were stuck in veal crates because they have no use in the dairy industry and they're all killed uh, eventually. That's, you know, people get their hands on animals, they do bad things. Uh, and it's not a pretty picture, really no matter what species it is. And I have to say, when you look overseas, we get jarred because it's animals we don't eat. But it really doesn't matter what species they are. They all suffer. Uh, these animals are alive because in countries where there's not a lot of refrigeration, you buy them, tie them together by the legs. You can see they're looking around. And then you kill them just shortly before you put them in the pot. Am I cheering you up? <laughs> and if you look at what's happening to people, this is diabetes back in 1994. The dark states, more than 6% of the population have diabetes. And look at 95 and 96 and 97. As our diets are worsening, diabetes is racing in. And then we change the colors for some political reason in 2006. <laughs> but you see that the trend is accelerating. So what's the answer? Well, if you look at the next generation, it's off the scale. One in three kids is already overweight, and the federal government's answer to this, what are we going to do with all the diabetes? What are we going to do with all the heart disease? Sell you drugs. And to get drugs, we need animals. This is, this is a normal mouse. This is what we call a DBDB mouse, uh, genetically bred to be instantly obese so that we can test drugs on them. Um, in fiscal year 2011, at just the Diabetes Institute of NIH, there were more than a thousand different research studies at almost, well, over a half a billion dollars, more than 70,000 animals in experiments, and hundreds of thousands more bred and killed, and it's, it's more this year and more the next year. So we need really two steps, and we do this with every campaign. The first thing is we've got to prove it. We have to prove that there's a better way. And that's what PCRM's job is. We have doctors, we have scientists who show how uh, we can do good diabetes research, good cancer research, good heart disease research. And then once we know what it is, we got to push it. I do not want to be a quiet academic society. I want us to make sure that people know the truth and that we take action and we change things. Uh, we have to be impatient. So in 2003, the National Institutes of Health funded our research team to test a vegan, low-fat diet for type 2 diabetes. And it changed the, the world of diabetes. The American Diabetes Association now recommends the diet that we have. It's part of their clinical practice guidelines. Um, PBS, I don't know if any of you have seen this, PBS picked it up and said, okay, maybe there's something here. And um, Geico, of all places, you know the car insurance company? They are about three blocks from our office. And there's 2,500 people working in there. And they said, you know, we're self-insured. Every time anybody needs heart surgery, we got to pay for it. So they said, wouldn't it be nice if everybody here was vegan? So what we did is two things. We offered, we showed the, the cafeteria manager how to do vegan foods. And we did a study of their cholesterol levels and their weight and people who had diabetes, how they did. And this was kind of new for them. There were a few missteps along the way. <laughs> it, took, it took the chef a little time. <laughs> but he got it. <laughs> anyway, the people who didn't do the vegan diet, they didn't lose weight. The people who did lost weight very nicely. And so Geico got all excited. Oh, oh by the way, I, our two worst participants, Hillary and Bruce, they came to all of our vegan meetings and they sat in the back and they just chatted and talked and looked into each other's eyes and paid no attention. And I brought, I brought really good cooking instructors and they were complaining that Hillary and Bruce were distracting everybody. Well, I have to tell you, you can misjudge people. And I misjudged Hillary and Bruce. They, they did talk a lot 
and they were distracting, but what they were talking about was how they were going to convince her parents to go vegan with them and what they'd pick up at the store on the way home and how they would get through Thanksgiving. And a year later, they sent me this picture. And Hil Hillary's lost 85 pounds. Bruce has lost 100 pounds. And so they, they really talked it up. And so then Geico said, well, that's pretty good. Let's do your program in Buffalo. Let's do it in Chevy Chase. Let's do it in Dallas. Let's do it in Fredericksburg. Let's do it. They, 10 Geico sites all then offer the program. Um, so anyway, then our power company in Washington, Mindy, you don't know this. We just did this. Um, Pepco, which is our, what is it here? It's like. How we're supposed to get our electricity. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, they've had some troubles lately. But anyway, Pepco just adopted it as well, and it's making their linesmen work faster. Um, so. <laughs> The old way of, of doing research is that it, we need to prove what a plant-based diet can do. The old way of doing it is we do two or three years of a diabetes study followed by several more years of a cancer study. We've got a new method where we recruit large numbers of people. We bring them in at the same time and run studies concurrently. We have got a good staff to do it. And the reason is I've calculated all of our collective life expectancy and I've decided we've got to speed it up. So. Anyway, but we can't do it without you. So many of, of the people here, the people I mentioned, but many others as well, have helped us to do that. So whether it's advertising for research participants to come in, or paying for the tests to draw their blood, or having our lobbyists on Capitol Hill to work, you all have made that possible. And I really appreciate it, and my only request is that we work faster and harder so that, so that we change things uh, much sooner. Uh, doctors need a lot of help. They learn nothing about nutrition, so we make the nutrition guide for them and give it out free to the second year medical students. We're now approved by the AMA to give continuing medical education to doctors, um, which is growing all the, oh, believe me, they need it. Um, have some of you done our Kickstart program? This has been so much fun. It's an online program where every day you get an email with cooking videos and menus and recipes. And, um, oh, and Brendan is one of, one of our, our um, leaders in the program. In fact, I'm going to just mention, Brendan is one of our coaches with our Veg Run program. So for, I run for planes, but for people who run half marathons and things like that, uh, we now have, have the, the Veg Run program, which I hope you'll take a look at. It's vegrun.org, I think it is. Um, China is the biggest country in the globe, on the globe. Meat, meat eating has doubled in the last 20 years. So we now have Kickstart in Mandarin. Um, we've had thousands of people sign up. I, I can't do a, a tour in every village in China, but I can go online and we can reach people in ways we couldn't, even just a few years ago. Um, the second biggest country is India. We now have Kickstart uh, for the Indian subcontinent and the Spanish language Kickstart is starting in October. Um, we're having a live program. If any of you want to come to Washington in October, we have three nice weather days in Washington, <laughs> and that's when it's going to be. So please come. We're going to have a great, uh, a great session that we call the Kickstart Intensive. So the last thing I just want to mention, the world is kind of conspiring against us in many ways. The, the federal government still subsidizes meat and dairy very heavily. That microscopic part, that's the vegetables and fruits. So things are not getting better really quickly. In 2009, we said, scrap the pyramid. It's a nice shape, but people eat off a plate. And this is what the plate should be. Healthy foods, throw out the meat. And look what the USDA actually came out with in 2011. I'm not taking credit for it because it's not quite perfect, but you can kind of see that if you work hard enough, you, you kind of drag them along a little bit. Um, and then the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, which are the blueprint for everything, that every school lunch program and so forth, uh, we worked very hard. It's not perfect, but we got two full pages on vegetarian and vegan diets. That, um, and then there are some times where you just have to be in people's face. We ran this in Wisconsin. Um, so. Anyway, uh, we, have, we do things to really try to push the envelope, to try to get attention. Um, it's, oh, it's a bit of a job. We, uh, 
We went into grocery stores. I, I don't know if you know this, when you take the head off a chicken in a slaughterhouse, and then they go through a cooling bath, the feces spreads from one chicken to the next, and it soaks into the chicken muscle, and if you test for fecal contamination, it's there in large quantity in about half of chickens. So um, we're trying to let people know. Isn't this lovely? So anyway, the great thing is when you look around, the world is changing, and it's changing in a good way. So many people are going vegan. Uh, you know what the welterweight champion of the world now is now vegan? Uh, Mac Danzig, the uh, mixed martial arts, is now vegan. Th there's the meat eater there. So, oh my God, I hope he's all right. So, anyhow, um, so, anyway, the National Institutes of Health. The people who are putting the dogs in the cages, putting the mice and the rats and the monkeys and the pigs and all the other animals and hurting them, wasting your money, they do not care what you think. They don't care what I think. What they care about is what scientists, the scientific community writes. And so what we do, and so they're continuing this, what we do is we do research where we bring in people, we publish our findings, and once they're published, we then work on Capitol Hill because NIH cares dramatically what Capitol Hill thinks, because that's who writes the checks. And so our strategy is you lay out the science, and you push it like crazy, and you change the policy from the top down. So we've got to prove it, we've got to push it, we've got to be right, but we've got to be impatient. That's the most important thing. I do not want to see one more candlelight vigil hoping things get better. What we've got to do is to really work hard be right, be assertive, be smart, be strong. So many of you have been doing that for a long period of time. So many, with our group, with other groups, we're working together, we're, we're all working as hard as we can, and if we do it, I think we're gonna win. So thanks very much. <laughs>